G'day, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Be sure if you enjoy this content to click subscribe. You've got to take care of that first and then click that bell. That way YouTube will be forced to let you know every time I'm putting out a video. And in today's video, I want to talk about uh, how faith helps us overcome temptation. And temptation comes from three different sources. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us the world, the flesh, and the evil one. And in order to do that, I want to take a look at what Thomas Aquinas has to say in his prologue to his commentary on the Apostles' Creed. Very succinct, very awesome, had to share it with you. So here it is here. We'll be going through this. He says there are basically four effects, four good effects of faith, and one of them is it helps us overcome temptations. I want to go through these one by one because I think it's incredibly insightful and will help us in our walk with the Lord. Aquinas says, we know that every temptation is either from the world or the flesh or the devil. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, it's important to know where the temptations come from. Uh, it's also important to realize that not every single temptation is directed at us by one of these three things. We might be tempted to think, you know, the devil doesn't exist. We just get temptations from the world or from our flesh. Or we might be tempted to think that all temptations come from the devil. So that's why this is important. Um, so let's go through these one at a time. First, he discusses the devil. He says, <clears throat> the devil would have us disobey God and not be subject to him. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas says that Satan wanted to have beatitude apart from God. He wanted to have the fulfillment of his nature apart from God, as it were. Couldn't. Rebelled against God took a certain amount of angels with him who became the demons. And he says that the devil wants this for us too. He wants to drag us away from God, not to be subject to him. But he says that faith helps us overcome the temptations of the devil, since through faith, we know that Christ is the Lord of all things and must therefore be obeyed. And he quotes 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 where our first Pope says your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he may devour, resist him strong in the faith. Here's a beautiful image of Thomas Aquinas, by the way. Love that. We'll hide this though. You don't need to see that. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, I mean, we can fall into one of two traps when it comes to Satan. We can think he's hiding under every rock or we can think that he doesn't exist. And CS Lewis says that the devils and Satan, especially, is pleased with, with both of these mistakes. But I suspect that today, uh, most people, including many Catholics, would want to uh, say that Satan is more like a force or he's more like a way that we explain evil, that he is not a person. The head of the Jesuit order, unfortunately, just said that. Um, so look, let's just say it as clearly as we can. Satan exists and he hates you intensely and wants to drag you to hell. And hell is a real possibility for you. That is to say, eternal conscious torment, eternal, unending, uh, is a possibility for all of us if we do not obey Christ, if we do not repent of our sin and turn to him. This is a terrifying thing, obviously. But if we want to be Christians, we can't deny it. You cannot be a Christian and deny one of the core elements of the faith. That's just picking or choosing, sort of like cafeteria Christianity, as it were. But I do think that many of us try to explain Christianity without reference to the demonic, uh, spiritual warfare and Satan. And this is woefully insufficient. It would be like trying to explain the Lord of the Rings to somebody who had never heard of it. Such a hopefully no one like that exists, but unfortunately, I think it is the case. And suppose you said to this person, well, there were these people that were called hobbits. And it doesn't matter about who they were or what they were for now. But the point is, there was this ring, right? And it wasn't conducive to the flourishing of Hobbiton, where they lived. And so what they did is they took this ring and they destroyed it. And then things were really great again. And I think sometimes, just like that's woefully insufficient, we can explain Christianity like that in an insufficient way. We can say, God exists and he loves you. He sent his son to die for you so that you can be reconciled with him and have eternal life. And just like, you know, with that explanation of the Lord of the Rings, where's, you know, where's, all, where's the talk about Mordor and the ring and Sauron? Likewise, we can say, where's the talk of the demonic, of the spiritual warfare in which we are engaged 
whether we want to be engaged in it or not. And certainly St. Peter has no problem saying that the fact is that this person, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And after this, he says that this experience is common of the brotherhood throughout the world. So this experience of spiritual battle isn't something that is reserved just to very holy people or, you know, priests or nuns in convents or something, but to you and me. Now, these next two temptations can come from the world and the flesh. It's important that we realize that when we talk, we're talking about the world in this sense, we're not talking about the created universe, which God created and which is good. When we talk about the flesh, we're not saying that our bodies are bad. We're talking about something different. And we'll get to that as we look at each one. So Thomas says that the world tempts us either by attaching us to it in prosperity or by filling us with fear of adversity. And there's a lovely quote, I believe it's in Jeremiah, where it's, uh, Jeremiah says, or the Lord says through Jeremiah, that my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the font of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, and the cisterns are broken. Uh, so in Palestine, you have three sources for water. You have living water that comes from a spring. You have groundwater, such as would be collected in a well. And then you have runoff water, which were these big ditches dug into limestone and then sealed up to kind of maintain the water that would run into it. This is inferior water, obviously, to living water. And, li- and God goes on to say, and the cisterns are broken. Uh, they don't even bloody work, you know. And this, of course, is the trap that we fall into. We seek the fulfillment of all desire in the world around us, in prosperity, in the opinions of others, in our successes that other people deem important or not, and so on and so forth. And we shouldn't do that. There should be a detachment from this world and a recognition that God and God alone is the fulfillment of all our desires. And then secondly, he says, up there, he says here, there's that. And then we also fear the adversity that that can come from the loss of certain things. And Aquinas says that faith overcomes this in that we believe in a life to come better than this one. And hence, we despise the riches of this world, and we're not terrified in the face of adversity. And here he quotes John, 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory which overcomes the world. Two things to say here. First, you'll notice that with each of these, Thomas quotes sacred scripture, which I just think is fantastic. You cannot get through a paragraph of Thomas Aquinas without running into sacred scripture. Yes, he quotes Aristotle a lot. He quotes St. Augustine more than Aristotle, but even more than St. Augustine, he quotes sacred scripture. When you read Thomas Aquinas, it really you really do have the experience of of a sort of Bible study. Yeah. So um, very good. This helps us overcome the world. St. Teresa of Avila said that the most horrible life here on earth will be from the vantage point of heaven. It, it will seem like nothing. It, it will seem only like a bad night in, a, in a, a crummy hotel. And that's it. Because when we encounter the glory of God, we will realize that, first of all, it was all worth it, no matter what we went through. Um, But we'll also see things in perspective. And we can begin to see things in perspective now when we realize that here is, this is not our home. This is not where we set up camp. Uh, It is helpful, I think, to realize that in this life, we cannot be fully happy in this veil of tears, as it says in the Hail Holy Queen, that is indeed a veil of tears where we will suffer, where life can be horrible in many respects. So Thomas Aquinas says that we will be fully happy in heaven. We can be happy to a great degree in this life if we follow the Lord, but we won't even be fully happy. It's not even possible in in this life. And so when we recognize that, that can sometimes be the first step to a good degree of happiness that we wouldn't otherwise have if we just thought that we could sort of set up tent in this life and be happy. Finally, he says the flesh. And again, by the flesh, he's not saying the body is bad. The body, of course, is good. God took on flesh, and so he wouldn't have done that if flesh was evil. But when we talk about flesh, we're talking about the temptations that come from our disordered passions and our lower appetites. He says, the flesh, however, tempts us by attracting us to the swiftly passing pleasures of this present life. 
But faith shows us that if we cling to these things inordinately, we shall lose eternal joys. And he quotes Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, where St. Paul says, in all things, taking the shield of faith. We see from this that it is very necessary to have faith. So again, this is the fourth reason he gives of the goods of faith. You can go to uh, check out his commentary online. I'm going through this very soon on Pints with Aquinas. We'll, we'll delve into this at greater detail, but he goes through four reasons. Uh, but there you go. Uh, if we are faithful to Christ, he will save us. We've been saved in baptism. Uh, we, we are being saved by him. We will be finally saved. But of course, if we reject Christ and we follow our passions, right? So it's, let's say, uh, you know, I'm married and it's getting really difficult. You know, we're fighting quite a bit and I don't, the kids I, I see is rather cumbersome. If I was to leave my bride for another woman and abandon my children, I would put my state in a seriously dangerous condition. That is to say, if I were to die in that state without repenting, I would go to hell uh, for all eternity. But likewise, if I find life difficult now with my wife or my kids, by the way, I love my wife and my kids, but we all experience difficulties. Um, but I choose to carry the cross, which the Lord is calling me to carry, and I cooperate with the grace that he gives me in order to carry it, I can trust that if I'm faithful to him, I will encounter a joy with God after this life that I cannot even begin to fathom in this one. So there you go. That's what Thomas Aquinas has to say on how faith helps us overcome the temptations from either the world, the flesh, or the devil. As I say, if you don't yet subscribe to Pints with Aquinas, you can type Pints with Aquinas into your podcast app or pintswithaquinas.com. Subscribe. You can learn a bunch more cool information like this from the angelic doctor. And also be sure to click subscribe and that bell so that you'll see all the videos coming out in the future.